What a beautiful time of worship. Hannah, thanks again for getting us started on that. We really enjoyed that. If you have a Bible this morning, Luke 22. Luke chapter 22. Once you find Luke 22, if you would join me in standing. You feel like you're getting your exercise today? Luke 22. We're going to begin reading in verse 14. Luke writes, when the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I earnestly desire to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten saying, this cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. Father, thank you. Thank you that we have this opportunity today to understand more clearly what the Lord's Supper represents, why it's important that we observe it. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would teach us today. We just pray that we would walk away from this place knowing that you love us and that you showed that love by dying for us. And so we thank you again for the opportunity to hear your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. In light of the fact that we will be observing the Lord's Supper at the end of service today, I thought it would be kind of a good idea to devote today's message at looking at as to why we observe the Lord's Supper as the church. Some of you know that there are two ordinances that we observe as the church. That is baptism. And the second, of course, is the Lord's Supper. Now, one thing that happened after man fell in sin was for God to establish a covenant with man that was entered into by the blood of animals, goats and rams and lambs. And because it was a covenant that was entered into by the blood of animals, it was not a lasting covenant. That is, the blood of the animal was not sufficient enough to cleanse man from their sin. And so as a result, under the old covenant, the high priest had to keep making sacrifices for the sin of man year after year after year. But here's what you need to understand today. This is so very, very important. The Old Testament is all about the Old Covenant. Now, there are some who, who, who would say, well, you know, the Old Testament is not important, you know. But it is. Now, the Old Testament is very important because it's all about the Old Covenant. The New Testament is all about a new covenant. But for us to understand, and really, I believe, appreciate the new covenant, now we have to understand the old covenant. And so the new covenant, the New Testament, is all about the new covenant that God has established with man. Now remember, the old covenant was established through the blood of animals. Was it sufficient to cleanse man from their sin? The new covenant that God established with man it was entered into by the blood of Jesus Christ. And because it is a covenant entered into by the blood of Jesus Christ, unlike the old covenant, the new covenant, it is a lasting covenant. The blood of Jesus Christ, it was able to do something that the blood of animals couldn't do, and that is to cleanse man from their sin. 
Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 says, Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord. And so through the blood of Jesus Christ, we can enter into a covenant relationship with God. That is an eternal covenant. And so the church is a group of believers who have entered into the new covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ. The church is a covenant community. And again, Jesus Christ, he's given us two ordinances to carry out to represent this covenant relationship. Baptism and Lord's Supper. Baptism. Uh, many of you, you've, you've been baptized. Some of you, you're, you're here today and, and you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, your Savior and Lord, and so you've never followed the Lord in baptism because salvation comes before baptism. But baptism is a picture of a life united with Jesus Christ through his death and through his resurrection. Very, very important to understand that. One of the things that happens, one of the things that, that baptism represents is that we go into the water as a picture of us identifying with Christ's death. We are now dead to sin, as Romans 6, 11 says. But we don't stay in the water, do we? Aren't you glad you came up out of the water? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I've never been to a baptism service where, where the pastor took them under to represent death and never brought them back up. <laughs> No, you always bring them back up. Why? Because that's a picture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And because Jesus Christ arose, we can now live a new life, Romans 6, 4. And so it can be said that baptism is like a wedding ceremony. Some of you, you you've, you've gone through that. You, you've been married. You've gone through that wedding ceremony. Some of you, you're sitting here thinking, someday I hope to. Right? And some of you are sitting there thinking, I don't, I don't really care. <laughs> but baptism is kind of like a wedding ceremony where we, where we basically publicly declare our love for Jesus Christ. We identify that we've entered into a covenant relationship with him. So if it can be said that baptism is like a wedding ceremony, then it can be further said that the Lord's Supper is like an anniversary where we celebrate the love that we have for Jesus and our continual identification with him in the context of this covenant relationship. In the verses I read earlier, we find Jesus doing something very important. Jesus, he sits down with his disciples and he, he shares with them a Passover meal. Now, the Passover is something that, that was very, very important uh, to the Jews, and it still is to this day. The Passover was an annual celebration of the Jews where they looked back, they remembered, they celebrated how God delivered them from Egyptian captivity and how their firstborn was saved from death, if you know the story, because of the blood that was applied to the door frames of their homes. The angel of death came, but the angel of death would see the blood on the door, door frames and what, what happened? Passed over those homes. Thus we have the Passover. And so according to the Old Testament law, the Passover was, was to be a lasting ordinance. It was to be an annual celebration to commemorate the salvation of God because of the blood of those animals. And so that's what we find Jesus and his disciples doing in Luke chapter 22. They are celebrating the salvation of God through the Passover. Now, I want you, if you would, you don't, you don't have to hold your place, but if you would now flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Because the Jews, they celebrate the Passover, right? Let's look and see what Paul writes to a group of Gentile believers in Corinth. First Corinthians 11, verse 23. And following. It says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in doing so, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. What I'd like for us to do just in the, the remainder of our time together, I, I want to ask some questions, and I want to give an answer to the question that we ask. So here's the first question I want us to answer today, ask and answer. Who should participate in the Lord's Supper? Who should participate in the Lord's Supper? Here's the answer. Those who have identified themselves with the saving work of Jesus Christ. The Passover for the Jews is a day when they celebrate the salvation of God on their behalf because of the blood sacrifice of a lamb. And, and so in participating in the, in the Passover celebration, what they are doing, they are identifying themselves as those who have benefited from the saving work of God. Now the Passover is a Jewish celebration. It is not a Gentile celebration. It is a Jewish celebration. As Gentiles, we don't identify that event in history when the angel passed over uh, the, blood, the homes that had the, the blood on the door frames as the saving work of God on our behalf. There's nobody here who says, you know what? When, when that happened, that's the day that, that I was saved. That brought salvation to me. That, that didn't bring salvation to me. Okay? And so we don't, we don't look at that and we don't say that was, a, that was an event in history in which we, we, experience it, we experience the saving work of God on our behalf. However, there is an event in history that did occur, whereas we identify as the saving work of God on our behalf, and that is the day that Jesus Christ offered his life on a cross as, they, as the blood sacrifice for our sin. And here's what happened. He not only laid down his life for Gentiles, but he also laid down his life for Jews. So listen, Jesus Christ, he laid down his life for the world. He laid down his life for everyone. And so that is the event in history that we look to as the saving work of God on our behalf. It's not the Passover. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. That is what we look to. And so here in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul was writing to a group of Gentiles in Corinth about the manner in which they should observe the Lord's Supper. And again, that's what we're going to celebrate in just a few moments. These were people who identified themselves with the saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And so it's clear that it is only those who identify themselves as beneficiaries of the saving work of Jesus Christ work on the cross. It is only those who should participate in the Lord's Supper. Okay? If a person doesn't claim Jesus Christ as their Savior... I mean, if you're sitting here today and you say, you know what, I've never, I've never trusted in Jesus Christ as my Savior, then here's the deal. You don't have any claim for participation in the Lord's Supper. It is only those who confess Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord who should participate in the Lord's Supper. You know, I want you to think about it for just a moment. Some of you, you you're married, right? And if I ask some of you guys, what day you were married, what year you were married, you'd scramble. <laughs> Some of you would. But hopefully, every year you celebrate an anniversary, right? Well, I want you to think about something for just a moment. Just as it makes no sense for a person to celebrate a wedding anniversary when they have never identified with another in marriage, it makes no sense for a person to celebrate the Lord's Supper when they have never identified with Jesus Christ in salvation. I know of no one who's going out and saying, you know what, I've never been married, but I'm celebrating my anniversary. <laughs> you don't do that, right? It's only when you've been married that you celebrate the anniversary. Listen, it's only when you've identified with Jesus Christ and his saving work on the cross of Jesus Christ, on the cross, that, that, you, that you celebrate the Lord's Supper. And so we have to understand who should celebrate the Lord's Supper. 
Again, it's a celebration of the love that we have for Jesus Christ. It is, a, it, it is a continual identification with him in the context of this covenant relationship that we have with him. And so, I just want to say this. If, if you've never identified with Jesus Christ in salvation, if that's you today, then you really have nothing in which to celebrate. It's only those who, who have trusted in Jesus Christ. You have something to celebrate. The fact that you have been cleansed from your sin. Forgiven for all of, all of eternity. So, who should participate in the Lord's Supper? I think Scripture is very clear. Only those who identify with Jesus Christ and His saving work on the cross. Here's the second question. Where should we have the Lord's Supper? Where should we have it? Here's the answer. Where there is a gathering of the church. Where there's a gathering of the church. The Bible doesn't give us any clear instructions as to where the location of the Lord's Supper is to be observed. You're not going to find that. It doesn't say it has to be held in a, in a sanctuary like this one in order for it to be acceptable in the eyes of God. The only thing that is evident is that it should be observed with other believers and not just as an individual. I want you to look again at what Paul writes there in 1 Corinthians 11, 33. He, he talks about... So then, my brethren, when you what? Anybody have it? When you come together. To and so, I believe the scripture is clear that, that we're to come together to observe the Lord's Supper. Now, the believers in Corinth, they, they, didn't, they didn't observe the Lord's Supper by themselves. They came together to observe it together. Just as baptism is something that we do as a public statement. I mean, baptism is something that you're to do, you're to do before other people. And just like you're to do, do that before others, the Lord's Supper is also something that we do as a public statement. It's something that we do together as a church. And we're going to do it together as a church. And so where should we have the Lord's Supper? Listen. It could be in a place like a building like this. It could be out in the field. Listen, it could be in a barn. It could be in a hospital. As long as there is a gathering of God's people. Listen, I believe it's certainly acceptable in the eyes of God. And, 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 and so we have to understand it's very, very important. It's something that we celebrate together. It's not something we celebrate by ourselves. We are the body of Jesus Christ. And so together we celebrate. Here's the next question. When should we have the Lord's Supper? When should we have the Lord's Supper? Well, the Bible doesn't give us any specific instructions as to when we should have the Lord's Supper. It doesn't say we have to do it on Easter or Christmas. It doesn't say that we have to do it every, every time there's a fifth Sunday. We, we choose to, to do it every time there's a fifth Sunday around here. Uh, but it doesn't say that we have to do it every time there's a fifth Sunday. But I do think that we can conclude from Scripture that, that it is something that we should do often. Now look again there at 1 Corinthians. We didn't read these verses, but look at, at 1 Corinthians 11, 25 and 26. It says, in the same way he took the cup. Also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this. What's it say? Some of you, it says, as often. Anybody else have another translation? Rarely. Whenever. Do this as often, regularly, whenever, as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so the word that's really important there is the word often or regular <coughs> or whenever. The Lord's Supper is something that God wants us to do often. It's something that he wants us to do frequently. And here's the deal. Everyone is going to define often differently. Often for you may, be, may mean one thing. Often for me may mean something else, right? Now, some define often as weekly. Some of you may come from a tradition that, that you observe the Lord's Supper Every single week. And again, some people, they define it that way. Some are going to define it, uh, define often as monthly. Some of you maybe had it once a month. Uh, some are going to define it as quarterly. We, we do that around here. But here's the deal. The church that does it weekly, 
perfectly within the bounds of Scripture. The church that does it monthly, perfectly within the bounds of script, boundaries of Scripture. Church that does it quarterly, certainly within the boundaries of Scripture. Here's the deal. The important thing, the important thing is that however often it's done, is that it's always done for the right purpose and with the right passion. You know, it, it, the Lord doesn't want it to ever become so... So, what's the word I'm looking for? Ritualist. Ritualist. Yeah, that's a word. Thank you. You read my mind. I love it when you do that. <laughs> Most of the time. Uh, <laughs> he doesn't want it to become so rit ritualistic that it loses its meaning. And that can happen, right? And so... When we observe the Lord's Supper, whether it's, listen, whether it's every week, whether it's once a month, whether it's once a quarter, the Lord wants us to do it for the right purpose, and He wants us to do it with passion. I hope today that when, when you observe the Lord's Supper that there is a passion in your heart because of what it represents. Okay? So, when should we have the Lord's Supper? Often. We should have it often. What is the Lord's Supper? This is very, very important. What is the Lord's Supper? Well, in light of the verses we've read today as well as other scripture, I, be I believe we, we have to understand the Lord's Supper to be a symbolic meal that reflects the sacrifice that Jesus made for our salvation. The bread is symbolic of Jesus coming to this earth in a human body, offering that body in death on a cross as a sacrifice for our sin. The wine or the juice, it's symbolic of Jesus' blood that was shed to cleanse us from our sin. Listen, the Lord's Supper, it is, it is not something that we participate in to obtain salvation. Okay? When you, when you partake of the Lord's Supper in, in a few moments, you don't partake because you're trying to earn or obtain salvation. That's not why we do it. It is something that we participate in that symbolizes Christ's work of salvation on the cross. Now, there are some who teach that in participating in the Lord's Supper, one actually obtains salvation. And those who hold to this teaching, they, they claim that there is a change in substance of the bread and wine that occurs during the Lord's Supper. That is, that the bread actually turns into the actual body of Jesus, and the wine or the juice actually turns into the actual blood of Jesus. It's called transubstantiation. Now, the primary scripture that's used to support this teaching is John chapter 6, verse 32 through 58. But here's, here's the verses that, that we really focus in on. It's, it's verses 53 through 57. It says this. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh, drinks my blood, abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. And so those who believe in transubstantiation, they take this passage literally and they apply it to the Lord's Supper, what they call um, the Eucharist. Now, to believe this teaching is to believe that in receiving the Lord's Supper, one is in fact receiving salvation because in receiving the Lord's Supper, one is receiving the literal body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Furthermore, to believe this teaching is to believe that the body of Jesus Christ is being offered over and over and over again for the sin of mankind. And the Bible is pretty clear that Jesus Christ offered himself once for all. Amen. Once for all. Why? Because he is the perfect sacrifice. His blood was sufficient. His body was sufficient. So, so he doesn't have to be offered. The sacrifice doesn't have to be offered over and over and over again. Listen, I, I, I personally don't believe that, that Scripture teaches that the Lord's Supper should be understood in this way. 
When Jesus says this, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves, he makes it clear what he's saying. In John 6, 63, Jesus says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you, they, the words that I have spoken to you, they are spirit and they are life. Jesus says his words are spirit. And so what Jesus was doing here in John chapter 6, what he was doing was actually taking physical concepts, which is eating and drinking, which we all do, to teach a spiritual truth. And, and if you read the New Testament and you follow the way that Jesus taught, he did this throughout his teaching ministry. What basically Jesus was saying was that just as physical food, just as physical drinks sustain our physical bodies, so our spiritual lives, they are saved, they are sustained by receiving Jesus as our sacrifice by grace through faith alone. It isn't, it isn't grace through, through faith plus the Lord's Supper. But rather, it is grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so if salvation can be attained by something that we can do, then we can't call salvation an act of grace. Because grace is God giving us something that we don't deserve. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says this, For Christ also died for our sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God. Listen, salvation is an act of grace. There is nothing that we can do that you can't come to church, you can't sing in a choir, you can't teach a Sunday school class, you cannot partake of the Lord's Supper to earn your salvation. It is an act of grace. It is a free gift offered to us by God that we receive by grace through faith in Christ alone. And so when Jesus took that bread, I want you to think about this for just a moment. When he took that bread that night in front of his disciples, and he, and he said to them, this is my body, remember that he was sitting right there in front of them. Okay? He was simply teaching them that the bread was a symbol of his body that would be sacrificed for their sins. Listen, when, he, when, when Jesus, when he, when he took that cup and, and he said to his disciples, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, remember his blood was still pumping through his veins. Jesus was simply teaching that, there, that that wine was a symbol of the blood that he would shed to satisfy the judgment of God against the sin of mankind. And so how should we understand the Lord's Supper? It, I believe that the Bible is very, very clear that it is a symbolic meal that reflects the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. And if you think about the Lord's Supper as, as I just said, kind of like an anniversary where you celebrate the love and how you continue to identify in this covenant relationship with Jesus Christ. Listen, when you celebrate your anniversary, you're not getting married again. You get married once. Right? And then what do you do? You get married once, and then the, when the next year comes around, you celebrate that you're still in this covenant relationship, that you still love this person. And then it comes around again. You celebrate it. You celebrate Listen, that's what we're doing today. We're in this covenant relationship with God through Jesus Christ because he shed his blood, because he gave his body as a sacrifice. And what we're doing today, we're not, we're not, we're not experiencing salvation over and over and over again. Listen, what we're doing, we're celebrating the fact that we've been saved once for all because of Jesus. Finally, why should we celebrate the Lord's Supper? Why should we do it? Well, certainly number one is Jesus tells us to, right? The Bible commands it. But one reason we should celebrate is to remember. We need to remember. We need to remember the body of Jesus. We need to remember the, the pain and the suffering that he experienced, the death that he experienced, so that we could experience spiritual health, healing, and life. We need to remember the blood of Jesus that has been sprinkled over our hearts to cleanse us from a guilty conscience that we might stand boldly and, and stand unashamedly before God. And so we, we, we celebrate the Lord's Supper to remember, but we also celebrate the Lord's Supper to reflect. Well, number one, we reflect on our sin. The Bible says we've all, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. That's why we needed a Savior. 
And so we reflect on our sin. Paul makes it clear there in 1 Corinthians 11, 28, that we should examine ourselves before we eat and drink of the cup. We need to understand that, that sin demanded a high price. My sin, your sin, it demanded a high price. The body of Jesus Christ, it was laid down on a cross. The blood of Jesus Christ, it was shed to pay the price for my sin and your sin. Therefore, it would be, listen, it would be a mockery to the body and the blood of Jesus Christ to participate in the Lord's Supper while cherishing sin in our heart. It would be a mockery. Listen, if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior and, and you participate in the Lord's Supper, understand something very clearly. And I say this because I love you. And I want you to understand the importance of the Lord's Supper. You are making a mockery of what the Lord's Supper symbolizes. If you are living a lifestyle that is contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ, listen, you are making a mockery of what the Lord's Supper symbolizes. And I just want to caution you to not participate until you have come before God with a broken and contrite heart concerning your sin. See, we don't just celebrate the Lord's Supper just because. We celebrate it for a reason. One of the reasons that we celebrate is to reflect upon our sin and, and the price that Jesus paid for our sin. What a dear, dear price he paid. And so we, we celebrate the Lord's Supper to remember, to reflect, but we also, we also reflect on the promises of God. We reflect on our sin, but we also reflect on the promises of God. <clears throat> See, the promise of God in 1 John 1, 9 is that if we confess our sins, he's faithful, he's righteous to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the promise. The promise of God in Hebrews 8, 12 is that, if we, that he will forgive our sins, that he'll forgive our wickedness, and he will remember our sins no more. Aren't you glad for that? And so once we've reflected on our sin, once we've reflected on God's promises, we are, we're, we're doing more than feasting on bread and juice. Understand this. We are feasting on the forgiveness and the faithfulness of God. <coughs> Finally, we celebrate the Lord's Supper not only to remember, reflect, but to rejoice. To rejoice. So many times... <clears throat> The Lord's Supper is only a solemn gathering. You know, and while it's true that reflecting on our sin and the great price that Jesus Christ paid for our sin is something to take very seri seriously, and it is, let me just say that it's okay to let a smile break out on your face every now and then during the Lord's Supper. Okay? In fact, I think, I think Jesus would love to see a smile as we celebrate what he did for us. I smile. Listen, I smile on my anniversary. I hope you do too. <laughs> Why? Because it represents the love that Melissa and I share. I'm not soft. I smile. I rejoice <coughs> in the love that we have. I smile at birthday parties. I smile at most celebrations, and you do too. This is a celebration. And again, there is a time to be solemn. I think the Bible teaches there's a time to be solemn, but there's a time to smile. And I think the Lord's Supper can be both. I believe we can be solemn as we reflect on our sin, but then when we, when we know that our heart's right with God and we really, really begin to remember what He did for us, boy, how can you not So we, we need to understand that there needs to be some rejoicing. Why? We've been set free. We've been set free from sin. We all know that in our, in our nation, there was a, there's a black mark on, our, on, 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 on our, our nation's history. We know about slavery. We know how, how there, were a, there was a group of people who, who experienced slavery, but, but they were set free. And, you know, I've watched, I, I've watched, and I've watched some of these churches, you know, and, and these African-American churches, and, and I'm telling you what now, they know how to rejoice. 
And you know what? Well, one reason I think they know how to rejoice is because they know what it's like to be in bondage and to be set free. Listen, the reality is all of us, we were in bondage, but we have been set free by Jesus Christ. So we ought to know how to rejoice in him and celebrate. Amen. Some of you are like, man, is he going to start swaying? I, I don't know. <laughs> what I'm going to do. I'd probably break my hip if I started doing that. So, right, huh? <laughs> But we've been set free. No longer are we slaves to sin. We are sons. We are daughters of God. Our chains are gone. We've been set free. Our God and our Savior, he has ransomed us. And like the, like the flood, his mercy reigns. Unending love. Amazing grace. We need to use the Lord's Supper as an occasion to rejoice that Jesus Christ, he set us free. And here's what the Bible says. He who the Son has set free is free indeed. So we need to use the Lord's Supper as an occasion to rejoice that we've been set free, but also that Jesus is coming back. Amen. First Corinthians eleven twenty six says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he what? Until he comes. He's coming back. He's coming back, and until he comes back, we observe this meal known as the Lord's Supper to proclaim his death on the cross for our sin. But listen, when Jesus comes back, and he is coming back, just like he came a first time, he's coming a second time. And when he comes, there will be no more eating of the Lord's Supper, but there will be a supper. Revelation 19, 5 through 9, tells of the supper says this, and a voice came from the throne saying, Give praise to our God, all you, his bondservants, you who fear him, the small and the great. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude and like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals under thunder saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean for the, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said, right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. Jesus says there in Luke chapter 22, he says, this last time I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this with you, but there's a day coming where once again, when the kingdom comes, that we'll, we'll sit down together. Listen, one day, listen, those of you who know Jesus Christ, you're going to get to experience the marriage supper of the Lamb. What a day that's going to be. You've been invited. If you're sitting here today, understand this. You have been invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Here's the question, though. Have you accepted the invitation? You say, how do I, how do I accept the invitation? You've got to accept the Lamb. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? Jesus. He's the Lamb of God. John looked at him, John the Baptist looked at him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's Jesus. And you've got to accept the Lamb. And here's the deal. The Lamb is saying, I laid down my life for, for you. I shed my blood. I gave my body for you. And the invitation is for, for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord. And so I want to ask you, have you accepted the invitation? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as the only one who can, who can cleanse you and save you from your sin? Listen, if you've done that, you have reason to celebrate in just a few moments. But if you haven't done that, then I want to encourage you to accept the invitation today. Accept the invitation that Jesus offers to take away your sin. Now, I just want to ask, this is, not, this, is, this is an invitation, but this is not our formal time of invitation, okay? So, so Brian, instrumentals, just stay where you're at. But I want to ask everybody to just bow their heads, close their eyes, nobody looking around. Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So I just want to give you an opportunity to accept the invitation that Jesus offers you. To save you from your sin. And if you're here today and it's a desire of your heart, would you just say something like this? Dear Jesus, I know that I've sinned. And Jesus, I know that there is nothing that I can do 
to save myself from my sin and the punishment of my sin. Jesus, I believe that you came, that you gave your body on the cross, that you shed your blood on the cross so that I could be forgiven of my sin. And today, by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ alone, I receive you and only you for my salvation. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. If you're here today and you prayed that prayer, you just passed from death to life. One day, you're going to be able to enjoy the marriage supper of the Lamb. But here's the deal. Today, you can enjoy the Lord's Supper. You can enjoy the fact that Jesus Christ gave his body. He shed his blood for you. You can remember. You can reflect. You can rejoice. I'm going to ask that everybody just continue to have your... Your heads bowed, your eyes closed. I'm going to ask the deacons who are going to be helping with the Lord's Supper. If you just begin to make your way down here. We're doing things just a little bit different today. But I think it's only appropriate that, really, that we just conclude this, this <coughs> message about the Lord's Supper by actually observing the Lord's Supper. And then we will have an opportunity for you to make some decisions as you need to. <coughs> Would you just take a few moments right where you're at? Would you just begin to allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart? Would you just begin to remember and reflect? Rejoice? Would you just make sure that you are where you need to be, your heart's where it needs to be before you partake of this course? And then just a few moments, I'm going to ask if we've had some time just to reflect I'm going to ask Mark to lead us in a prayer to give thanks for the body of Jesus Christ.